Welcome to the Evolved Caveman, where men learn to be successful and happy with your host, Dr. John Schinnerer, as he shares the most impactful ideas and practices for you to get the most from your relationships, your work, and from your life. Now, here's Dr. John. Hey, all you Evolved Cavemen and cave women out there. This is Dr. John with the Evolved Caveman podcast. And if you like some of the stuff that you've heard out there, be sure to check out my individual coaching packages at guidetoself.com. You can find out more at the evolvedcaveman.com. And be sure to check out the Ultimate Couples Retreat, which is a week-long, idyllic, adventure and journey into learning more about yourself and your partner and ways to reconnect in Costa Rica, September 2020. You can find out more at the ultimate relationship.com. Hey everybody, we're back with the latest episode of the Evolved Caveman. And I'm really excited to have with me today Bob Besamier. Hey. Uh, let me, you got the let me French go over Bob's down. bio real quick. I've known Bob for a bit, so we give each other a hard time. But uh, let's see. I, he wrote this in the first person, so he's going to make it a challenge for me to read in the third person. Uh-oh. A long time ago, he started out as a volunteer firefighter, an emergency dispatcher, and then made it to the Kent Washington Fire Department. He and two other gentlemen were decorated for pulling a man out of a car that was upside down and underwater in a moving river, which is pretty amazing. He was promoted to lieutenant. He has written two books nobody has ever heard of. He's been interviewed on CNN, The Wall Street Journal, Reuters, and some regional TV and radio stations. He has a master's in emergency and disaster management. And this is pretty crazy. And I I dumped off a bunch of other jobs, but some of his jobs include (laughs) ski instructor, capturing killer whales, software sales, Microsoft partner manager, but who hasn't done that? Mortgage broker, technology sales, dishwasher, drinking coach, spiritual advisor, chimney sweep, technology consultant to fire and police, and leadership and communication skills instructor. He has been bankrupt and a multimillionaire. He's had to reinvent himself a few times. He had open heart surgery when he was 46. When he was 46, the surgeon said he was supposed to be dead. Since then, he's also had partial knee replacements in both knees and five surgeries on his right soldier, all told 11 surgeries and 19 scars. Kind of like Jim Otto. But here's why he had so many surgeries, because he was in a Warren Miller movie back in 75, where 16 people held hands and did a backflip on skis, and they landed it and skied out holding hands. He was also a watch captain and a navigator on a 33-foot sailboat in the 78 Victoria to Maui race. Um, He's raced sailboats around Puget Sound for over 30 years, used to climb mountains and frozen waterfalls, and lives in the greater Seattle area, been married twice, and the last one has stuck for 30 years. And and Bob's a, a good friend of mine that I've met via podcasting, and we kind of became fast friends. So I was really excited to have him on, partly because he epitomizes um, growing up in that man box culture and kind of evolving past it. So I wanted to have him on. So thanks so much for joining me, Bob. How are you doing? Good, John. Thanks for having me. I love the French version of the name too, by the way. That was well done. Pesimier. Yeah, Pesimier. Pesimier. So I, you know, I have a, a bunch of things to ask you about that had to do with your life. And, and then this coronavirus came up and kind yeah. of hit a square between the eyes in a real hurry. Let's talk about that for a few minutes, and then we'll go more into your story and what we had originally sure. planned to. But what, do you, what are your thoughts about the coronavirus? I mean, you have a master's in emergency. What is it? Emergency? Emergency and, and disaster, disaster management. management. Yeah. Um, so what is your training? What has your learning told you about this outbreak so far? Well, the, the thing I keep kind of – I look at the news um, – and I look at online and I go try to find who knows what they're talking about. And it certainly isn't uh, a politician. Uh, and it's usually not anybody uh, who's a news announcer. Some of the scientists and researchers, uh, the one guy I really like so far is Fauci. Uh, he tells it like it is. And he's the one that's saying, yeah, we're failing at this mm-hmm. right now. This is not good. You know, we're, we were not prepared. We're not set up. We don't have the systems. And this kind of, you know, um, yeah, you have to really have people that know what they're doing in emergency management and in FEMA. And, you know, it's like when, when uh, George W. said, oh, Brownie's doing a great job at Hurricane Katrina. And it was a mess because Brownie didn't know really anything about that job. He was a political appointee. So we have, I think the, the fallout a lot of this is that we have 
uh, political appointees, not professional, um, you know, emergency disaster management, public safety people in too high positions. And, and they're, they're at a loss. They really don't know what to do. And they mm-hmm. haven't set us up for success. Um, they've just done their political bit. And, uh, and even now you can see them jockeying for a position, right? Well, this is all Obama's fault or, you know, uh, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt should have done, you know, <laughs> how far yeah, back you want to like go. The time for blame is past. And oh, long past. For, you know, yeah. an emergency preparedness plan and action mm-hmm. is now. And I mean, one of the things I keep hearing is that in the U.S., the test kits that we need are just not there. I read that we, and so what is it, um, you know, it's mid-March, and I read that in the last week, we only tested 77 people in one state because of a lack of test kits. Yeah, unprepared, not ready. And then we had misinformation coming out at the front end from our leaders and, mm-hmm. you know, kind of downplaying it. And mm-hmm. uh, it, it's, it's a problem. I mean, I've heard from one epidemiologist that we're going to be in this for six months. Yeah. And if that's true, like, I really am fearful of what happens to the economy as a result. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, this, this sort of feels like a big reset for maybe for everybody personally uh, in a sense of getting priorities straight and sort of a wake up call to what's important in life. Um, but also how we manage, you know, I was, I'm a, you know, I would say, right. Life can be a messy business. Well, mm-hmm. here we are. This is uh, one of the, probably the biggest mess we've seen in quite a while. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, it, it's, we're going to, like everything, I mean, I look back on all the other nasty things that have happened in the world over time, and we, as a society and a culture, will get through it. We'll hopefully learn a lot of lessons from it and be better for it. The unfortunate thing, like you said earlier, this is all, this is affecting people. People Mm -hmm. are going to die. And that is unfortunate. Um, Some are going to die unnecessarily Mm -hmm. because of these lack of preparedness things. That, uh, to me, is what, you know, um, I, don't, I don't like to talk about politics or religion, but this one is, you know, we, we sort of elect our politicians and pay them to do what we can't do individually, which is this kind of preparation. And when they fail, it's like, okay, uh, we need to get some people in here that can really help us next time and not fall down going, it's that guy's fault. Uh, what, you know, it, right now it's everybody's got to go, well, I, it's like it's funny to see people go out and buy toilet paper in <laughs> huge quantities. You can't eat that, <laughs> by the way. Uh, but you know, th- this is not a. Uh, it's not a. It's not an, uh, an attack from like a war. You know, where there's going to be shortages of food. The water. It's not a big thing where the water system is probably going to be contaminated and all that. But people are just going nuts with because they're not individually prepared either right. for life being a messy business. And they're panicked. Right. So they don't have a structure and a system to say, like like a firefighter would, right, emergency manager, what are the steps? Situational awareness. What has happened? What is happening? What's likely to happen in the near future? And what the hell am I going to do about it? What's in my control? What's out of my control? I can wash my hands. I can wear a mask. I can do a lot. I can avoid people. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, when like I think walk through it, one, two, three, four. Part of, of, part of going, the oh, shit, part of the plan obviously it. depends on your age and your susceptibility. Like my parents are eighty three, and they're self isolating, which makes sense mm-hmm. because they can't afford to get it. Right. You know, for younger people, you can afford to get it. You just don't want to be a carrier. So for the younger yeah. people out there that are listening and are like, "Oh, it's no big deal. It's like the flu." That's a little bit of a problem because you don't want to be a carrier. Because one of the big problems with the coronavirus is the contagiousness of it. I mean, from what, I've, from what I've understood at this point in time, we can walk around without symptoms, asymptomatic for up to two weeks yeah, and yeah. be spreading it. Then maybe you have it for a week and then you walk around for another seven to 10 days mm-hmm. spreading it again. And I just heard a, I just read a study that said that we're carrying it, we're contagious for up to 37 days. Hmm. So everyone that gets it is, is sharing it with about three people on average, whereas the flu, it's about one. And what's happening is that, that our emergency system, the, the hospitals are just getting 
inundated with people. From what I've read, there's rows of hospital beds lining hallways mm-hmm. and they're just swamped. So they're pushing off less important things like maternal um, prenatal visits and just saying, don't come in, you're going to have to wait. Well, that's kind of scary too. Like how long can you wait if you're seven months pregnant? <laughs> Eight months, nine months, 10 months. Can I come in now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, these are difficult issues. And one of the things is to, to try to get the right, really accurate information out to people. I read um, an article by a, a UC Davis medical director who actually started studying coronavirus 30, 40 years ago when he first got out of graduate school or something. And this thing is, is um, spread by droplets. You've got to sneeze right at or cough right into somebody's mouth and nose for them to get it. So when they were, were, how it's transmitted is I cough, I sneeze, it lands on something. Somebody else touches it and then touches their face or nose. They're going to get it. So they, you see people wearing masks, right? He's saying wear, wear a mask. Not because you can't stop the virus that way, really, mm-hmm. in a way. But you, you can quit touching yourself. Mm. <laughs> It'll keep you from touching yourself when you wear a mask. So, you know, some of this has got to be like, okay, let's come out with some real straight, information because then we can make decisions real decisions because right now there's so much bad information misinformation people are guessing and they're going out and buying huge quantities of toilet paper when they really probably don't need to one and i hate how it's being politicized too i mean we got china you know accusing the u.s military of planting coronavirus in wuhan we've got the russian propaganda machine saying Mm -hmm. that you know u.s is responsible for creating this. And while I can't say with 100% certainty that's not true, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, like, you can't control these things. So for anyone to release this would be kind of a diabolical act of evil. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a big fat who knows. That's like, okay, let's make up some stories to satisfy ourselves in some way. When really what I need to pay attention to is what am I going to do? Yeah. What's going on in front of me? in my neighborhood, in my house, in, with my family, the people I give a shit about, what can I do for them? And so what, do you, what are some of those things we can control? You mentioned a couple, but I think getting food and water for you know, a two to three week supply is not a bad idea. Yeah. Obviously six months of toilet paper is a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> you know, I'm think... really attached to my toilet paper. Yeah, yeah. Where do you think I do all my reading? Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think there's there's always this idea of, you know, emergency backup funds and, and um, supplies. And usually it's like three days. If there's a real, like, you know, earthquake, I'll tell you three days, you know, two or three weeks would be smarter just because you never know how long it can take. If you're not in a dire emergency situation and you've got a generator or something, you know, you, you, you could probably last quite a while on, like I saw this gal running out of going out of Costco the other day, cart was full of, uh, Chili, cans of chili, tuna, and water. And I'm like, okay, you know. That makes sense. You can can eat off that. You can live off that. Okay. I like all those. Me too. (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes together. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Chili, tuna, casserole. Yeah. So some preparation is great, but this thing is is probably not going to be, I don't know, my, my, if I was going to predict anything, I'd say, you know, um, a lot of this is the wobble from the panic and the, and the misinformation. And that, that's going to all sort of settle and narrow down a little bit. And what we come to find is that we, now we have a, we'll have a new normal and it'll be different than before this. And we'll just get used to doing it because mm-hmm. we're people and we're very flexible that way. Yeah. We're, we adapt. Yep. We can adapt to anything. That's the hedonic treadmill idea, right? That we can adapt to the good and the bad. Right. And it's, it's great on the bad side. It's not so good on the good side. It kind of undercuts yeah. our happiness, but that's a whole nother discussion. Right. Um, right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for going there with me. Any other thoughts sure. on that, that before we head oh, to? I, I think really it's like, you know, for if I was going to give anybody advice, um, don't watch too much news and, you know, go be selective about who you listen to, about what's going on and what information uh, you have to find really the um, solid, good, accurate information. Um, yeah. What do you think about people that don't believe in science? Good luck with that. <laughs> I mean, because I, I, I do think there's a large part of the country that um, is really mistrustful of, quote, the elite and science and research. And I, I think it's in moments like this that 
that's all I'm trusting is science right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and it is, it's choice, right? In some sense, you, you have to decide where, who am I going to believe? Who's more li- at least more likely to be right than the other person? You know, right? find, yeah. find at least the, the, the best information you can. Are they going to be 100% accurate? No, nothing is, you know? It's like nothing lasts forever. Um, so you're, you're back to decision-making and yeah. critical thinking and problem-solving. So walk through these things carefully, thoughtfully, try to pull the emotion and the bullshit stories we tell ourselves about things out of it. Yeah, and it's Fast funny because even, because I, I think getting close to, cl- as close as you can to the reliable source or, you know, the original source, like an MD, an epidemiologist, um, National Health Services, uh, World Health Organization. But I even got an email on a psychology listserv the other day that said it was from Stanford. It, someone forwarded it saying it was from Stanford medical school and it turned out to be a hoax. Now huh. some of the information in it was okay. Some was like drink cold water as often as you can. Cause that washes the virus down or I guess the bacteria uh, virus the virus back in, into your uh, stomach and that killed the stomach acid will kill the virus. And it's like, well, so then someone came on and said, nah, this is, this was not accurate. Um, so you, you got to be careful out there these days. There's a lot of misinformation. The, the scammers are coming out. They are yeah. out in full force. Uh, yeah, it, it's uh, price gouging. All the all the bad behavior that people do is comes along with what hopefully there will be more altruistic, unselfish behavior to overcome it. But uh, yeah, yeah. I even uh, there's a a talk show host who shall remain nameless, but um, he was selling toothpaste that he claimed fought coronavirus. Oh, God. Well, that's a hell of a deal right there. Yeah. yeah. Jim Baker, the former PTL, praise the Lord mm-hmm. guy, and all that, Tammy Fay or whatever her name was, uh, in Minnesota, they, they um, slapped, slapped him with an injunction to stop selling the silver or whatever, something or other that was supposed to cure coronavirus. Like, no. Wow. Go. Just don't. Ah, <sighs> man. Good, good okay. Christian fellow there. Yeah. <laughs> Gives them all a good name. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that's why, you know, it's funny because it's people like that that I think are forcing more and more people to claim themselves as spiritual but not religious, which is the fastest growing religious denomination in the country. Just being spiritual, like a Buddhist. Yeah, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. I don't subscribe yeah. to any particular religion, but I do believe in a higher power. Yeah. And, yeah, spirituality is different to me than religion. Religion yeah. is, this is what it says, see? Right. And see, I believe in a higher power, but I don't want anyone telling me like the right and wrong way to do it because I don't trust most of the people that are doing that, honestly. Yeah. Well, this is all based on belief, right? So how the hell do they know if they're right? Right. When, and to me, like, um, you know, faith is an emotional leap. There's nothing rational about it because we can't get any um, tangible proof that God exists, I would argue. Yeah. Unless you believe in miracles. Yeah. Um, Some people do. Yeah, and I and I've heard some stories of miracles, and I'm like, wow, that sounds pretty good. But I didn't see it myself, so hard to say. Yeah, but anyways, we were way off topic here. Yeah, well, we I'm, I'm taking you into the uncomfortable yeah. deep end, Bob. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry. All right, so t- <laughs> tell me. When, let's go back to the very beginning. Let's start at the very beginning. First, I was born, and then adopted. <laughs> I was born a young child. Yeah. I'm leaving out the full line from the jerk there because it's no longer appropriate. So what do you look like at your very best? You know, that was an interesting question you asked because I thought, you know, and I look back at my life and go, where did I feel like I was like really me and I've done it, done something? I thought, well, I'm, uh, I'm usually wet, cold, dirty, sweaty, um, some version of that. Your wife must be so um, excited. <laughs> yeah. So arousing. It's like that was, um, you know, uh, sailing, right? I mean, you, you get into this zone of what I'm at my best. I, I'm, uh, we're doing good. I have a good crew. I'm keeping them safe. They're having a good time. I'm having a good time. We are totally in the zone. We've lost total. We don't know what time it is. We don't know how long we've been out here. We are, you know, 
if you ever felt that 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 kind of zone thing, it's like must be like what rapture is or something. You know? Well, and and that's the I mean the zone is when we stop thinking, right? You lose yeah. self consciousness, and as you're saying, you do lose track of time. So it's a really really desirable state to be in. It's just hard to get into the flow to get there. Yeah, and even, and that's that's a positive thing. Then there's oh, also yeah. the problem side, which is I have to dig. Like as a firefighter, right? When I the, the best fires were the ones where I came out feeling tired, worn out. I'm wet, cold, stinky. I look like shit. I got crap all over my face, and I go, "God, that was great." I have never heard that phrase before. The best fires. Yeah. <laughs> just see, just a it's different a framework. Sad. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> like, yeah, you know, it's not that we want. Everybody. How would you rate that fire, Bob? Yeah. On a scale of one to ten, one being shit and ten being amazing. <laughs> I know it's sort of a weird deal. It's like if well, if they're gonna have one. We're not wishing those on on anybody. No, I understand. Know? But if if, they're, if if somebody's like going to have one, if it's going to happen, then firefighters are all like, "Well, I want to go. I'll go help. I want to go help." Right. So there we yeah we get into it's a twisted, dark humor. Well, you but thing. you have to overcome those those basic physical urges, the the human instinct for survival, to really run into any fire. I mean, and so you say it's twisted. I would say it's training. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, in it a is. way it's twisted, but thank God you do it and can do it because right. you guys do stuff I could never do. Well, see, and that's, and that's just training. That's education. That's knowledge. That's equipment for Insanity. Sure. Yeah. Just like catchers, <laughs> catchers, catchers, the tools, uh, you know, everything the catcher wears, they call it the tools of ignorance because you got to be nuts to be a catcher. But firefighters go in when everybody else is running out. They've had the training, background experience, all that equipment you know, um, to handle that situation. So they're good with it, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's like life. If you, if you, the thing with, with life, I think is so important is that it's like the fire is a big deal and we got trained to do that. Most people never get much training on how to handle the messy shit of life when it happens or make these really big decisions because they don't make them very often. Mm -hmm. How many houses do you buy? Yeah. How many times do you go in for heart surgery? How many times does your house catch on fire? Yeah. I don't think no. mine's ever caught on fire. <clears throat> yeah. How many times do you go bankrupt? Zero so far. Yeah. Me once. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, so, so you, you don't have these, um, you have a, a limited experiential background to make these decisions on that are really important, really critical. It's like, you know, you have a house fire. We go to, the more house fires we go to, the more we're like, here we go. Yeah, well, it's just Instead, my oh, shit, yeah, like the routine. rookie. Yeah, the rookie is like his pants are on died. fire. Oh, so we tell me, tell me, a, tell me a great story about your firefighting days because this is so far from my field of experience. <laughs> well, it, it's um, hmm. the one, the one, the one time. You know, I started as a volunteer, and I and I because a friend in high school said this is from high school said this is really fun. This is back when we rode on the actual tailboard. I mean, oh wow! Like, yeah, we're hanging on with yeah. two hands on a bar. We're not tied in. And sometimes we're putting on our bunker gear while we're back there, one hand in it, while the thing's going down the road. It's come a long way. And it's like, whoop, you know, <laughs> I'm sure there, there were certainly instances where we get down the road. We lost one. Whoop, where did where did Joey go? <laughs> uh, sorry, we'll be back stop to pick it. you up later. Yeah. And we'd have like a little buzzer finally in the back. Says, eh, eh, eh. You know, stop, <laughs> we lost a guy. <laughs> and that guy's all embarrassed. Yeah. Like, oh, man, man overboard. <laughs> I got to take shit for the next two uh, weeks. Yeah, the guy that, of course, falls off gets nothing. But hopefully, you know, he's okay. He doesn't break anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Killed. But, you know, it's sort of like you fall off and, and you will receive tons of grief over that for the rest of your career. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, he's the guy that fell off the tailboard. Yeah. <laughs> that gets you a nickname. So, yeah. So, and then when I got um, in the paid department, I, I, I just thought it was really fun and, and I thought, I, t I talked my brother into, I have an identical twin brother. I talked him into coming in too because I said, hey, Bill, this is great. It's really funny. He was like, yeah, I don't know. And I said, hey, you know, you, chicks dig firefighters, buddy. You tell them you're a volunteer firefighter and you show them the bunker gear in the car, you're getting a date at least. Or at least they'll talk to you, you know. Um, so he goes, oh, okay. <laughs> and of course, he ends up being in longer than me, ends up being the fire chief. He was the One of the great chief. motivators for men. Yeah, yeah, dates started when we were young. This is like when we were like 20, 21 years old. He ends up being the, uh, he was the fire chief in Littleton, Colorado when the Columbine shootings happened. Wow. So, yeah. 
But so, you know, I mean, I go to Kent and I, and I'm, I have to think about this now. I go, oh, now I'm a full-time paid firefighter and they say it's risky business. Cool. That, that sounds good. Uh, they say, you know, you want it to risk your life. You risk your life every day. I'm like, no, they don't. Been doing this for a while. They don't risk their lives every day. You know, there might be a time when you might, that might happen. But every day, nah. Um, you have to have something happen, right? So then I get into Kent and I'm, and I'm on the aid car and we get this car in the river. <clears throat> and we have a little trouble finding it because uh, it's along sort of an open area back behind Boeing. And we finally find this. And the car is, is indeed upside down in the Green River, down a long bank. I don't know if you've ever seen the go down to the Green River in Kent. There's sometimes a long, steep bank down to the river. And we looked down there and go, yeah, that's the underside of a car under there. It's probably a couple of feet under. And, and the, somebody's gone, yeah, there's a guy in there. We're going, what? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. And how fast is the and water moving? Uh, it was June. So it was, it was spring runoff kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah, it was moving. It was, yeah. So um, when I got down there, there were two guys. Two other guys were already sort of at the car in the water. And as I'm walking down the bank, I'm going, oh, Oh, this is what they meant about risking your life. Because mm-hmm. I've been a scuba diver, and I'm like, this is, you know, I don't have the, we don't have the equipment. Right. You know, if this, if this, and we're on the up river side, we got to get this guy out. Things could go badly here. Yeah. This, this is a little dangerous. This is more than a little dangerous. <laughs> so, um, the two guys held my feet, and luckily the windows were down. It was June, summer day, and the windows were down in the car. So uh, they held my feet, and I actually sort of like tried to get in the car to go find whoever was supposedly still in there. And I started in the in the um, front seat, figuring driver's side is yeah. he there? Nope. So that's one breath. <clears throat> come okay. back, and then you come back up. Could down again. Down go there? farther. Huh? Oh pff, no. Okay. It was mud brown. Are you feeling kind of. Yeah, just feeling around. I was opening my eye yeah. eyes, and but I couldn't do that very well because it started to sting because of the mm-hmm. crap in the water. I couldn't see very far anyway. And um, so then I go into the next farther, you know, next seat over, try to get there. And these guys above me are like, yeah, I told them, do not let go of my feet. Yeah. You get sucked in here and you won't see me again. Yeah. Um, nope, not there. So then we go, <laughs> going, fuck, let's try the back seat. Close. Third nope. time. Third. third time. Nope. Couldn't find him. Fourth time. Found him in the back, way back in the corner of the thing. Found like wow. um, his legs. So I started pulling, uh, you know, trying to get, he was floating. He was up. Wow. And what would be the, like, the between top. The, yeah, well, that would, would be, it would have been the seat, right? The car was upside down. Okay. Right? So he's up. So I find, I got to pull him down, get him down out the door, out the window, uh-huh. right? And, and then have the other guys help me. And we got him uh, out and then to shore and the paramedics were there and, that was a messy CPR thing because every time we pumped his chest, stuff came out. Yeah. I don't know how I got the mouth. Oh, yeah. That was not That's fun. tough. Till somebody, yeah, no, it didn't last too long because the medics had a bag. Um, you know, we could, yeah, so we, <laughs> luckily. Um, but we had a heartbeat. He was alive at the, at the shore. Amazing. Um, when we, yeah, um, when we packed him off with the medics, he at least had a heartbeat. Um, but apparently he died two weeks later of pneumonia. Uh, too much fluid and stuff. And yeah, wow. he didn't make it. But I thought that was like, okay. And then one time too, we had an apartment fire. Um, and uh, I was a lieutenant at the time. And, and so I'm the third guy. There's a nozzleman, another guy, and then there was me. And uh, we had a four-man crew, which is rare. Uh, was rare back then anyway. Uh, and one guy at the pump. So we're, we go into this apartment. We're thinking, oh, it looks like the fire started up on the second floor. So we're going up the stairs, right, to inside the apartment to go up and go find the seat of the fire and put that sucker out. First guy goes up, you know, so we're sort of spaced a little bit on the hose. First guy's going up, you know, up through the middle. Second guy, I'm the third guy. The next thing I know, I've fallen through the stairs. <laughs> wow. And I'm sitting there like, with my arms up, like I've got myself. So you're holding on to the stairs with your yeah, arms. I'm on the stairs, but the rest of me is down in the in yeah. the stairwell, and I'm going, "Oh shit! Here's the here's the seat of the fire. It's under me." <laughs> I go, "Hey guys, guys, found it! Help, help, found it! 
<laughs> a little help. So they pull me out of there and we get back down and, you know, just put a squirt in there and get that. Uh, my, I had to get a new pair of boots. Melt? Yeah. Melted? Mm-hmm. Wow. Down. So um, that one was a little scary. Then I had one more where this is back when we only had two guys on an engine, which was totally unsafe. You know, uh, pump operator and lieutenant. This is. Yeah. Yeah, this was. So we have a house fire, a small house. And there's just two of you. Just me and another guy. <laughs> we're the first do. I mean, there's other people coming. Oh, okay. But, but yeah, we're the first do engine and there's only two of us on this engine. And I got a rookie. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so we got a fire and it's, it's, you know, dispatch says flames visible. We're like, okay. Of course, this, new, this is his first fire, right? This new guy. I'm like, oh shit. So he's pretty puckered looking. So we get there and I go, okay, <clears throat> I'm going to take this pre-connect in the front door. I put the air pack on and all that. And then I'll go in the front door. And I should have waited for other people, a rapid intervention team, more folks. I mean, I should have just friggin' stood there and waited it out. But I'm like, nah. So I go in the front door and, and clearly he has this pressure pumped way the hell up. It's supposed to be like 150, 175. And I'm going, I bet you he's got over 200 pounds of pressure Ooh. on this friggin' thing. It's kind of hard to muscle around. Yeah. So I go in the door. And by the way, backdraft all the movies. If they show a nice, clean area where there's a fire, I've never seen it. Hmm. I, I can barely see the hand in front of my face. So I'm stumbling around in this house going, oh, there's some glow in the back there. Um, and I can hear things sort of, you know, rumbling around in the house. And, and I go, okay, so it's way back there, way in the back. So I start walking back there, and I'm sort of tripping over a little furniture, moving shit out of the way. And all of a sudden, I hear this crunch, bang, and I feel this something come down back behind me and bounce off my helmet and air pack um, and hit the ground. And I'm going, wow, whatever the hell that was, it was heavy. And now I can't move the hose. So I'm like, well, shit, I'm screwed. I got to get out of here. So I just turn it off, walk back out. Next engine crew is coming in and we go, hey, we need another line in here. (laughs) Mine's not usable anymore. So we put the thing out and, and we're doing overhaul and we figure out that, you know, what people do. Somebody had an axle in their attic of a car, an axle oh of a gosh. car, right? Like a big, yeah. yeah. So that's from the fire. It got weak or something and pff, down it came. Well, that's where I store all my axles. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. So, and it missed me by literally inches. If it would have come down on uh, my head. I would have killed you. I would have killed me. Or it knocked, sure as hell knocked me out. But yeah. It crunched a vertebrae or two. I've already got a crunched one anyway. And yeah, it might've killed me. I'm like, Ooh, got lucky there. So yeah, one of the things that yeah, thanks for sharing those. Those are amazing. One of the things that impresses me about you though, is you're 64, right? Yep. And you are still playing baseball Yep. as catcher. Yep. Yeah. After two knee partial knee replacements and five shoulder surgeries, I can actually I was just at practice this last couple of weekends, throwing from uh, third to first, which is the same as home to second. So I'm like, yeehaw, the shoulder is back. After, it's been a while. Last year, yeah. I didn't play it hardly, really at all. I didn't play it all because of my knee surgery. So I'm pretty stoked to get back at it. And it's a fun thing. It's like, this is the thing like I do, like I did sailboat racing for 30 years when I love being out on the water and all that. But it's really that, sharing something with other fun people you know that's yeah. a happiness thing to me that's that was like that's happy hold time on, hold, on, hold on yep i gotta find it there it is yeah so i just wrote there was a a masculinity report that i just came across mm. and they asked five thousand men in the u.s where'd my glasses go hold on yeah. about what was So they asked him about sort of their level of happiness with a series of questions Uh and then asked them how satisfied they were with key areas of their lives, careers, work-life balance, relationships, money, physicality, mental health, and then asked them about core values. And so just quickly, the number one thing, what gives men in the U.S. their greatest sense of well-being is meaningful work or Uh the dignity of labor. Number two is inner health, which was both physical and mental health. And mental health was actually valued more highly by men in the U.S. right now than physical health. 
was like 52% to 43%, which I thought was very hopeful and impressive. Um, And that seems like that's a change that, that. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And number three, age. So as we get older, we get happier. Mm -hmm. So we reach uh, a peak at our mid fifties and then being married was fifth highest. And that was interesting because, oh, and I think uh, among them was income. So that was in the top three. But fifth highest was being married, which is kind of interesting. So being married or being in a committed relationship or dating were high. The single guy was the lowest in happiness on average, lower than divorcees or widows. Wow. So even if you got Uh, that friend saying, oh, dude, single life, I'm getting laid every other night. They're not that happy. (laughs) Just saying. But then the the next one was friendship. And Mm. they found that like playing on sports teams and being, you know, hanging out with male friends mm-hmm. was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> right. When, it's like the fire, fire department. Right? You hang out with fellow firefighters, male or female. I mean, yeah. you're, you're, you've got a group. You're, you're pulling the same direction. You're trying it's to... It's camaraderie. Some, it's bonding. Yeah. It's friendship. Yeah. It's conversation, communication. Yep. yep. So firefighting is like that. Um, sailboat racing was that, like that. <clears throat> Baseball is like that. I'm the general manager as well. And then the catcher, of course, because... I got to be alone. Well, that's why they let you play, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> and I get to, <laughs> I get to say. His yeah, manager, I, come on, put him ninth in the batting order. Right, right, right. Yeah, I am going to catch this inning. Thank you very much. How's your BA? Oh, my BA. Batting average. Oh, yes. uh, yeah, I'm about a 300 hitter. That's good. Not in this league. <laughs> oh, that's not very good. But, no. Bob, you need to work on your eye, your eye-hand coordination. Yeah, most bat of speed. Been, Keep it yeah. flat through the zone. Well, I and now I use a thirty-five inch bat too, which hardly anybody does in this division. But I, I'm doing my bat's thirty-six. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Where do you? I'm just saying my bat's bigger, <laughs> heavier, girthier. Well, shit. Actually, I gotta, I gotta get a thirty-six inch bat now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I got the heaviest bat on the team. Uh, you know, it's physics. Force equals mass times acceleration. I go with the mass because acceleration I ain't doing. I don't have the, you know, young guys can do acceleration. Oh, yeah. yeah. I can't. I'm too old. Uh, yeah, I can't twist like that anymore. Yeah. yeah. So so tell me a little bit about the, the financial ups and downs that you've had in your life because those oh, stories yeah. were pretty fascinating too. Yeah. So um, in the, you know, late 90s, um, I've been after I left the fire department. I've been in technology jobs, and some of those pay pretty well. And and my wife happened to be with one called Exodus. And um, at one point, that stock was worth four and a half million dollars. And this is part of the not being smart. This is ignorance <clears throat> at its worst. Um, we were just letting it sit there because it was oh, you know long-term, got to hold long-term or something. You know, we, you know, whatever we thought, it was totally wrong. Because in 2001 was dot bust and everything came crashing down. Yeah, I lost so it, a, a business during that period. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people did. A lot of people took it right in the shorts. Uh, you're probably familiar with alternative minimum tax. Mm-hmm. The bane of- Not as familiar as you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we went from four and a half million to, uh, we finally sold all that stock for forty five hundred dollars. But uh, yeah, the IRS, in its infinite wisdom, says, "Well, we're going to tax you on the gain that you saw, uh, and and we're, we don't give a shit about the loss." I'm like, uh, "But it's you know, it's all paper. We didn't like right. I didn't buy yachts, big right. houses. I got a house in Italy now, and you know, it just sort of sat there, paper um, gains, if you will, you know, uh, phantom gains. They would call them." But it triggered AMT and some other stuff. We had some really bad advice from a uh, a CPA as well. It didn't help. So we were screwed. Uh, you know, we went from having being multimillionaires to having a lien on the house and spending over $100,000 trying to uh, legally get ourselves unwound. Sue went to Washington, D.C. and testified before Congress in a committee meeting about AMT and what should be done about it. She was uh, uh, actually testified over there, which was an amazing thing. Um, And uh, in the end, we had to do bankruptcy um, to get ourselves 
unhitched from a million dollar tax liability that was on paper money sort of thing. It was a huge, hard, nasty lesson on money. And that's when I went and I got all kinds of financial certifications. You know, I was an accredited asset management specialist and all this other stuff and, and um, wrote a book called the top five money mistakes people make and how to fix them. Um, and um, did webinars and seminars around the region for people to say, don't get yourself caught like I did. And then too, I was, I was um, trying to tell people too about the mortgage issue. Um, and then of course in 2008, it was cause I was teaching these classes right up, you know, right before then, then 2008 at all, that whole thing, mortgage industry blew up. And I was like, kind of like, well, kind of thought that's what's going to happen. So how did you so, deal with that emotionally? Cause that's a big hit. That is. And, and it's like, you, you go in there and, and you're in court and they are, they're doing their thing, which is the mechanics, you know, and, and it was my name on the bankruptcy, right? I, I'm like, okay. Um, and we had to do things like Sue sort of had to semi get herself fired and we had to, you know, just sort of, in a sense, look as poor as we could for the bankruptcy mm-hmm. court. We didn't have credit card debt though. I mean, the, the only thing we had debt at the end was the house. We lost that. And it's, it's a hell of an ego mm-hmm. whack, you know, um, it's embarrassing uh, yeah. initially, you know, it, we spent 10 years trying not to do it and spent money. And it's like, looking back, it's like, well, that was stupid too, actually, because we should have just said, screw it. You know? Well, yeah. I mean, one of my fundamental beliefs is that we men will do a lot to avoid from being embarrassed and a lot that doesn't make rational sense. Because as you said, it would have been smarter financially to just go, ah, oh, let's do BK. Yep. We'll just go bankruptcy. Yep. Um, but it's hard. I mean, it's hard for our ego. It's embarrassing. Um, and, and I've seen that in almost every man, I, every man I've ever spoken with. We just don't like to be embarrassed. Because it's a competency to me, it was, I, I'm, I am now proven to be incompetent when it comes to money. Success to me is not so much that I have money, but that I have some, <clears throat> excuse me, some sense or some feeling of I'm competent at something. I was good at sailboat racing. But is that true that you were incompetent? Because I would argue it's not. Well, I was ignorant of some things that, you know, um, again, we had, and we paid the fancy pants financial advisor and, and CPA and stuff. And none of these people said, get the hell out. Yeah. You know, get out now, diversify now. They were just like, Hey, wow. Ride this one out. Cause it doubles every three months. Yeah. But then, you know, and, and they get into that tunnel vision, of, <clears throat> you know, instead of going, well, you know, every time I see that the stock market up now and say, that's a new high, I go, it'll come down. Yeah, it will wait. Well, and I like that. I, lo- I love the word vicissitudes because it means the ups and downs, right? And yeah, yeah. our moods go up and down. The financial stock market goes up and up and down. Natural disasters, they come and they go. I mean, mm-hmm. everything has ups and downs. Yeah. It, it's kind of the idea of regression to the mean that everything eventually. <laughs> I reverses. love that term too. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, what you want though is the mean to be rising, right? I mean, trending upwards. Yeah. yeah. The people that don't do anything, that don't learn anything, their mean stays the same, low. Yeah. So they, it, you, when you learn, you have more knowledge, skills, and abilities. Your mean goes up. You know, um, Kahneman and Thaler and all those guys in Tversky, right? Started out with Israeli really? fighter pilots. And yeah, and they said, well, well, where are they? You know, when we compliment, we say, hey, uh, or when they do a shitty run they, and they go, okay, you fucked up, then it goes up. They go, yeah, see, just keep pounding on them. Well, then they do a great one and they say, good job. It comes down, regression yeah. to the mean. So they yep. finally figured out, oh, let's just change the mean. Yeah. We got to raise the mean and then, you know, yeah, they'll actually be but, better, more consistently better fighter pilots. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's interesting that, that embarrassment mm-hmm. idea, you know, I, I tell a lot of my clients like, you know, why I'll ask them, why are you so opposed to feeling embarrassment? Yeah. Think about it. What is it about embarrassment? That's such a problem for you. It's just fucking embarrassment. It goes away after, a few minutes. And so, you know, after thinking about this for several years, I just started embarrassing myself out in public. <laughs> By the way, Bob, I'm really fun to hang out with. We should go walk around your hometown sometime. Yeah. Um, yeah bet. <laughs> but I mean, I'm always embarrassing. I've got a 14 year old daughter and I'll do this, the stupidest shit in like stores. And, yeah. and so 
I, I like to, uh, when, <laughs> when I'm dropping her off at middle okay. school, I'll, I'll roll the window down and I'll, I'll scream, goodbye, honey, I love you. Have a great day at <laughs> school. And, and so I'll do that randomly <clears throat> yeah. to, to just keep her on her toes. And we, we've mm-hmm. had this talk about embarrassment and how important it is to get comfortable being embarrassed. And I must be hell to be a father. <laughs> but um, today I dropped her off. And she gets out of the car and I said, love you. And I was completely composed and totally dignified. Right. And she wa- starts walking away and I roll down the window and there's a mom walking away from the office. And I said, see, honey, I didn't embarrass you today. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> she loves me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I think embarrassment is just, it's like so many things in our lives. It's a story we're making up. Mm-hmm. Nobody probably really gives a shit. No, not you as know, much as we go, do. Somebody, Yeah. I go to somebody and say, yeah, I, I declared bankruptcy once. Oh, you did? Wow. Yeah, oh. me too. Yeah, oh, yeah. And then you go, oh, me That's too. That's the other part, yeah. Yeah. But it's like, okay, I made up a story like I, I'm incompetent and I'm, I'm uh, a fuck up and I'm bad or something that I did this. But it's like, I wanna, as I went through it, I'm like, well, screw that. You know, you go through it and you go, well, okay, we, we went through this. And it, I mean, it was 10 years of you know, lean on the house and yeah. finance. It was 10 years of strain. A reminder. Reminder all the time. Yeah, you know? I mean, I've got a group of, uh, <clears throat> I'd say 10 male friends that I hang out with and I think probably three of them have gone through BK. Wow. Yeah. So it's not that That's, uncommon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and these guys were smart guys. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, I, but I, I figured it was a, okay, I don't know enough because I'm big on if, if I have enough knowledge I can do better. More knowledge is a good thing. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is, but then you got to, it's, it's part of like what I'm doing with as we get older, right? Is there's a lot of bullshit out there. There's a lot of stuff that's like, mm, maybe not helpful. You know, it's twisted. Yeah. I mean, I agree. Knowledge is power. I, cause I learned that from the ABC after school special, but, um, <laughs> sorry, I just had to throw that in there, but yeah. I, I mean, getting my PhD, like I also realized how much there is out there that, I just don't know. And I will never know. I mean, I can keep trying to learn my whole life and I will, and I'll learn about a thimble full of the knowledge that's out there. The trick is what's in the thimble. How to feed the dog. If you're going to get a thimble full, what are you going to put in there? Because you got to make an effort, right? To sort through all this shit. So put the good stuff in the thimble, find the good stuff that will actually help you um, and move your life forward and give you some sense of the satisfaction, happiness, fulfillment, whatever, you know, and understand that, you know, the, the, the price of admission in life is a guaranteed ticket out. So what do you do in the meantime? How do you manage that time? Uh, you know, and, and do it right. Because again, experientially, if I, I can learn from you, from other people who've been down a road that I haven't been yet. You know, I, I can learn from people that have been there, done that, studied that, have a PhD in this, know what is, in a sense, um, potentially coming down the road and how I can be uh, educated or prepared, you know, to handle it. It's like money things. Like if you, if you have stocks and have a bajillion dollars, um, diversify is a simple thing. Yeah. We should have. We should have been pulling. There were people that made it through that were just fine. They mm-hmm. kept pulling X percent out every quarter, every six months, every usually every quarter. They would pull yeah. and say, okay, get it out, put it into something else. Some of this is in safe stuff. Some of this is in high risk. Most of it's somewhere in the middle. We did none of that. Dumb. Ignorant. And we're here now. Yeah. But, but you, you know, know, you get through these things too, the right? The thing that crosses my mind is – you know, I was thinking as you were talking that, you know, I've got, you were saying, what do you put in the thimble? And I was like, well, I put, you know, stuff to help. I mean, like things about motivation, things about mood and emotion, things about how to communicate, things about relating to other people, things about understanding the mind and the brain. And then I was thinking about your thimble and you're probably more like a bucket. I'm more like a thimble, but I mean, your, your bucket is completely different than mine. And so it, it, made me think that I have to learn or train myself to trust people because you've got a vastly different sum of knowledge and experience that I do. And that's really valuable. 
And, and so it, it makes me think, you know, I, I have some clients recently that they've went, been through a lot of trauma and they don't trust anybody hmm. and how that puts you in a, in a bubble, in a vacuum and really hampers your, I mean, not only your ability to be successful, but your ability to be happy because you're cutting yourself off from connection and relationship. Right. See, and part of what you're talking about to me is this idea that I have of, because I'm a big one on frameworks I and mean, life is complex, complicated. So I'm always into chunk things into something I can manage. So we, we all have a life course where, where our life goes, our journey, our, you know, we're on our, I'm the, on the sailboat of Bob going across the ocean, right? Of life. I'm sailing. Metaphor. Yeah. What about Bob? I'm sailing. <laughs> so I've got this life course going. And it's really dependent on how the interaction of my world, which I mean is what's in my head, what I know and what I do with that and my emotional you know, thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, what's me, what's your world, what your is in your head and your mind, your thimble, if you will. And then there's the world, social structures and functions, coronavirus. And mm-hmm. the response to that is a the world thing, right? Financial markets and school systems and all that kind of stuff. So I have to interact with some portion of all of those usually, unless I'm a total freaking hermit living in a cave. So what do I do? How do, what, what is, what is important to know? And I would say that like in your line of work, those are the, what you described too are the most important things to learn are how do I manage my uh, health, my mindset, my relationships, my, um, colleagues and work environment for the sense of satisfaction or the fun that I have? How do I manage money? And then what do I think, because I have this big prefrontal cortex thingy here, how do I manage the future? How do I try to at least plan Mm -hmm. for and get to a future? Because whatever the current state is, it's going to change. It's like problem solving. Again, I got a current state that sucks. What's the gap between there and what I want? Well, that's, that's really what all these people that are trying to figure out globally on this pandemic is, how do we get to this other place? So that's the gap. Yeah, and, and I love the idea of kind of embracing change. Just the only yeah. constant in life is change. So the more you can get comfortable with change, mm-hmm. the better you get at life. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that experiential thing. Like, like mm-hmm. I look back at my life and go, well, I must not be able to hold a job. <laughs> <laughs> And and I find out about see, me. Wow, what a breadth of experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is always kind of how you spin it, right? It's perspective. Right, right. <clears throat> and and so there's a lot of things that, um, yeah, people say, when we start chatting about things I've been, they go, well, what the hell haven't you done? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's lots of stuff. Um, but that that's the thing, change and experiencing the world in lots of different ways and in different places and uh, that leads to a very, for me, it has, I mean, I think a rich, as my father-in-law would say, a rich, full life. Uh, and that, that's a, that's a decent goal. Yeah. Yeah. When, and I like the idea of, you know, kind of that there's an exercise of write your own eulogy yeah. or, you know, kind of imagine your own, um, your own burial and who's there and what do they say about you? What do you want them to say about you? Because the stuff that we normally get, you know, we have this addiction to urgency. And I I think the stuff that we get so wrapped up in doing and taking care of isn't going to matter much at the end of our lives. I I think what is going to matter is connection, relationship, your ethics, your values, and how you treat people and how you made them feel. Yeah. And that's the thing, I think, is as we get older, we finally come to realize that. And you, you can do it sooner. It doesn't have to be, you know, like this school of hard knocks and have life beat the shit out of you. Um, and again, these these experiences that that they might say build character, boy, they they can freaking suck at the time. <laughs> yeah. when, you, when you don't have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to handle something, to to at least have an approach, you know, handling it is a whole different thing than up to individuals, all that. But God, have an approach. So it looks like firefighters, right? Every time we went somewhere, we didn't know what the hell was going to happen. We didn't really know. It's a fire. What kind? What kind of building? Where is it? It's all different. But we had an approach to solve almost anything. I think firefighters would tell you that they could fix anything and solve any problem. They believe it because yeah. they've just seen stuff um, and have an approach that can work for almost anything. Well, I think those are good words to wind up on. I I, I always love talking to you, Bob. I, there's such ease, right? I feel like we can just... Uh... <laughs> 
I don't know, be ourselves, joke around. And, and I, I love that. I appreciate that. Um, so before we wrap up, tell people where they can get a hold of you. Tell them about your podcast as we get older. Well, yeah, you can go to aswegetolder.net. And uh, it's really about life navigation tools for men. And there's seven life areas that I talk about. Again, a framework, right? Seven life areas and seven um, life navigation tools or skills uh, that I think, and I didn't make those skills up, by the way. That's from like a, a UN, the United Nations, lots of other people said these seven are sort of the critical ones. Um, you know, communication, judgment, critical thinking, problem solving, decision making, and, and others. So how do we, again, sort through the bullshit and find some good uh, information, uh, ideas, advice, and information around how to live a better life, how to have a better now, how to, how to build a better future. Um, so there's a podcast there and, um, we're going to have, I'm going to have some classes coming up soon, uh, in at least the seven different, uh, tools. Um, like anything, you know, when I navigated about to Hawaii, I had to go take a class to learn how to navigate. And that guy is still teaching classes on navigation. It's unreal. His name's David so Birch. <laughs> when the classes come out, will they be at as we get older dot net? You'll, you'll see the uh, yeah. There'll be a, a tab there about uh, it's called the Man Academy. Okay. Uh, and it's like the Fire Academy. I was a Fire Academy instructor. Um, so it's the same kind of thing. You want you want to learn how to you know solve problems, be a firefighter. You go to the academy. So this is uh, the Fire Academy. So this will be the Man Academy, and it'll have classes on again these kind of tools and and things that hopefully can be useful, practical very down to earth and, and real sort of ways to help you build a better life. Fantastic, Bob. Well, as always, I appreciate the friendship. Um, Me too. This is just a blast. Uh, yeah. So that wraps it up for this latest fantastic episode of the Evolved Caveman. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 